Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com and use code Holly to get 20% off plus free shipping. Welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered. As you can probably tell, I am not the beautiful Holly Randall. She is very busy doing a million things because she's a superstar. And I am Casey Calvert, guest host for today. If you don't know who I am, I am an adult performer and director and content creator. And I am here today with JP the Pope. I'm JP the Pope. I am your friend. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we are. We are friends. We, this is not our first podcast together. It is not. Yes. Um, I am a director, a performer, for doing BDSM for both of those, um, and I am a podcast guy and all of the other weird things. I'm an adult creator person. You're a content creator. There you go. Yeah. As most of us are these days, content creators. Right. Which is something we will hopefully get to at the end of this interview. Hopefully. I don't want to jump directly to my plan for the end. Okay. Um, so let's start from the beginning. Okay. How long have you been working in adult? Um, this June will be starting my 18th year. So, and it's what, February now, mid-February. Yes. So yeah, I'm 17 and a half years or so. And which is a long time. It's a, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's weird because it seems like it, it's, I can think back and remember when I first started. And it was like this, oh, I'm here, and there's this cool thing, and then it doesn't seem that long ago, but then when I really start thinking about how far I've come from where I started, it's uh, it's been a long it's fucking time. It's been a time. long time, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, I want to talk about where you started. Okay. And your first job in adult. Um, technically, my first job in adult was back in Atlanta, and I was a night manager for a porn store. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I was, I started off, I was doing like factory jobs. I was the mm-hmm. forklift guy and I'm um, working in warehouses and I was working this night shift, 12 hour thing. And it was driving me crazy. Like I got to a point where I was sick. Like I would, I'd get up, I'd sleep all day and I'd get up to get ready for work. And I would just get like this depressed feeling. Like it wasn't like a, oh, woe was me, but I just hated it. I yeah. just dreaded going to work. And I was in a band with a guy who was working at this porn store and he was like, why don't you just fucking walk away from that and come do this thing? And I was like, Maybe I will. So I just quit, and I went and apply, applied. I was responsible enough to apply first, and I got hired on and moved up into, like, the manager thing, and I suddenly became this person who enjoyed porn, but now I had access to as much as I wanted. Um, and I started watching it, and there happened to be a – it wasn't a strip club. It was a lap dance – peep show area that okay. we had upstairs so we had girls upstairs yeah. and we had the the we called them jack shacks whatever they're called the place like a like a go into the room jack sh- off the, sh- the yeah the little video little booth. video booth yeah. yeah so we had those and then we had the section with the the lap dance and the peep show mm-hmm. um and i knew all the girls and i got to know one of them we started dating um, which was a big no-no in my manager's eyes because he was like don't fuck my girls and i was yeah. like but i really like this one yeah um, turns out she was a fetish model. Okay. So this is back in the 90s. Um, and she got hired to go out and actually work for Cybernet, also known, which oh, we know now okay. as Kink. Yes. And back in the day, um, they had, when you went to work for Kink, they had on, on their model page, it said, if while you're in San Francisco, contact, here's a list of all the other producers if you're mm. while you're here and you can blah, blah, blah. Right. So she went up and worked with Kink. I flew out with her because I was starting to get into photography. Mm-hmm. And she went and met with my old boss because he was the one that responded back and he was shooting out of his apartment. It was an apartment. I think it was an apartment Yeah. in San Francisco. And it was what was going to eventually become dungeon court. Okay. Um, she showed up, did the shoot and then called me and was like, Hey, go downstairs, get in a cab. And here's the address. And I was like, why am I going to this address? She was like, he wants you here because you're the boyfriend. And if you're interested, maybe you can be part of a shoot. And I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, and I'm like, I'm going to go work for a professional and go, take photos. Go do, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm going to go. I'm going to I didn't even hired. think like be on camera. Right, right. So I show up 
um, I meet them or meet him and we start talking and he's like, do you want to be on camera? And I was like, what's my girlfriend? What the hell? I don't sure. care. So I did a scene and him and I got to know each other a little bit during the day or during the shoot. And then I went back or that while on that trip, it rained like one day, so we couldn't go through the city. So I was like, Hey, I've got the camera. Let's do a photo shoot in the, the uh, hotel room. We did the shoot. We go back to the South back in Georgia and mm-hmm. I start editing and I've got this I think it was Photoshop 7, if that tells you how long ago it was. And I started editing the stuff, and I sent him a couple because I had access to him. I had met Peter from Kink, but I was like, he's the guy who runs this bigger company where this right. guy's I can, this is attainable. Right. So I sent him photos and was just to, hey, what do you think of this? Is this something that is even cool or what is, it would be considered acceptable as a photographer? And he gave me feedback, and then like three or four months later, he hit me up and said, hey, do you want a job? Okay. Were these, these were like bondage photos? Yeah. These were all, well, the ones that we did was, it was, it was artistic nudes. Okay. So. Yes. Um, that's a genre, pretty, by the way. Pretty, pretty bond. Any bondage or no? Just, no. it was just like art nude. My bondage at that point was uh, an extension cord and the phone cable because right. we all still had landlines. Well, yeah, then. I was going to ask if these pictures had bondage in them. If, if they were, they're mortifying now. No, they, <laughs> no, they actually are, um, they're artsy and she just kept changing outfits. Okay. So it was kind of like, you know, and of the window and over right. here on this cute place so right. um anyway he offers me the job and her and I talk and I was like you know this I have to do this I'm getting offered a job to go work at a company yeah so I pack my shit and my shit being a duffel bag a big book of cds and a carry-on roller behind me okay and I hopped on a plane a one-way ticket to Oakland and or SFO whatever it was I flew yes. into the Bay Area yes he met me and I'd only met him twice and here I am going to now live with this dude. Okay. So there was this, oh, shit in my head. I'm like, well, I hope everything's going to go well. I hope this guy's not a serial killer. Right. And I had just seen some movie. and I forget who the actor was, but it was, he. the actor reminded me of John. And mm-hmm. he was into like a lot, he was into like model planes and RC planes. And, but he was also like psychotic. And it was Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I don't remember the movie name, okay. but I just watched it. It was a cool movie, but the character uh, he played was psychotic and there was all this crazy shit. We get there the first morning and he's like, dude, come on, we're going to go for a ride. I was like, cool. And we get in his truck and we go out riding. We go all the way to the cliffs, right up to the ocean. And he reaches in the back seat and there's fucking remote control planes. So I'm like, <laughs> holy shit. What the fuck have yeah. I gotten into? Yeah. Clearly he wasn't psychotic and he didn't try and throw me off a cliff. Right. We go do the plane thing and the training starts and he starts, here's basic editing. Cause I knew Photoshop and that's one of the reasons he's like, all right, you can at least, you know, photo, uh, photography and you know, Photoshop. Let me show you basic, um, well, we final cut. We're using yeah. final cut at the time. So he starts teaching me and I mean, basic drag it into the line and she, mm-hmm. he showed me how to import the project um to drag it into the timeline and this is the razor blade and how you cut it out and okay. whatever you do do not use this dissolve thing okay so, <laughs> um we trained in his um apartment mm-hmm. doing the editing and i kind of stayed there and we there was like a, a some grocery store walking distance and we I, that's what we do we'd leave and go walk over and then we'd come back and edit and work okay and pack because he was in the process of packing up his apartment and moving down to LA. Right. And he even gave me the choice. He's like, you can come up now and start training and then help me move to LA or wait till I get to LA and settle in. And I'm like, well, I'm going, I don't want to sit down here anymore. Right. So he essentially hired you just as his assistant. Yeah, basically I was, I started out with doing, he would do, cause he was a one man show for so long. Yeah. So even with him on camera, he would move the camera around. He basically now had me to monitor the camera. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and he would take all the photos he needed and then say, give me some of the JP stuff because mine was artsy and his was very, this has to be, it was documentary kind of style. So I started doing that and we so we shot at our house and we ended up getting, um, a studio. And so we had the building once we moved to LA, Mm -hmm. um, and he got a little more like, okay, I want you to just do photos now. And he pulled back from it. And I would make, like, dude, why don't you try this? Or why don't you try that? He's like, can you do it? And I was like, no. He's like, then shut the fuck up until you can. <laughs> okay. So he was, he had a, um, he, it wasn't necessarily negative reinforcement, but he was very, he was very cut to the point. Like there was no mm-hmm. bullshit. He didn't sugarcoat anything. Right. He's abrasive to say the least. Yeah. So he was like, he spoke his mind. Like we're roommates. We work together. He was like, you can fuck off until you learn it. So yeah. I went out. And found um, 
Midori's book, and I okay. forget which one it is, but it's the one she's on the front with like a Komodo. Mm -hmm. I know exactly um, what book that is. And I started studying, and because we had rope around, I started yeah. studying the book. I started practicing on myself. I started, and I had a futon, so I would tie my parts of my body to the futon, mm -hmm. or I would try and get crazy on the futon with like mm -hmm. doing things. And then out of the blue one day, he was like, uh, we had someone that was going to, they wanted me to shoot. They wanted him to shoot. And okay. he was like, fuck this. I'm out. I'm going somewhere. JP, you do it. And I was like, I, uh, yeah. I, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> and then um, the producer, I forget her, Natalie Damore was her name. Okay. And she had Sasha Monet. So anybody okay. that's old school, that's another. And she, Natalie was like, well, the, here's all the stuff. She would print out all the pictures of the, the positions she wanted. She's like, here's all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you do this? And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Because I was good at looking and replicating. So I was like, I could just. Like we did. Like we did yesterday. Yeah, I'll yes. sit there and I'll reverse engineer it. Yeah. And it was super basic stuff, and we got through it, and then we came back, and she was like, John, this guy's so good, and he mm -hmm. was so blah, 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 and attentive, and I was like, I'm not even okay. sure who she is, but I'll take this. Um, and then he was like, okay, we're going to start doing this, and then he one day he put me on camera. He flew a model into L.A., and he started feeling under the weather, mm -hmm. and he's like, you got to do this. I was like, no, I don't. And he was like, you have to because I don't feel well, and this is I can't, she's here. Right. So I think I put a gas mask on, and I still had dreadlocks down to my ass. So even with a gas mask, you still knew it, it was, was me. Yeah. Um, and this tattoo on my yeah. arm. So, but either way, I was like, I'm hiding. So I understand. And it slowly pushed me a little more, a little more. I started realizing I always knew that I liked that kind of shit, but mm -hmm. I never, it was still very awkward for me. Sure. Because I was like, when we first started working together, he would start taking photos or something, and I would step out of whatever room we were in, and I would stand outside to be respectful. And right. I was also, as you know, I got shy. Yeah. So I was like, I don't want her to think that I'm being dirty and just staring right, at her. Right, that you're being creepy. Right. Yeah. And he came, he would come out and he was like, dude, she's paid to be here. She's paid to be naked. She's paid for this to happen. Stop hiding out there. And I was like, I'm just being respectful. He was like, shut up and come in here and pay attention so you can get better. Right. So, um, and little by little, we just eventually, we grew and I busted my ass and he rode my ass to get better and better and better. And um, we upped our studios, we started launching more sites and like, we were like, Hey, what about this idea? What about this idea? Mm -hmm. Um, and then we got to a point where we were kind of like, we had the solo girl thing. We had the bondage thing with me and him topping women. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there was, Oh, and then there was what it was the fucking machine site that was called Combots. Okay. So we had these three sites and there was just two of us. So we were flourishing. We were doing, this was back right. in 2004, 2005. When it was so easy to make money. We started Perfect Slave, which was the solo thing. And yeah. when we launched, I think 80% of the content that started on the site, the girls, 80% of them never were naked. They might have okay. had like a bra and panty or a bikini on and they were tied up. Struggling. 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 That was it. Damsel it, in distress kind of stuff. Right. And the crazy thing is without giving numbers or amounts away. Sure. That site in three months had more member sign up um, just in three months than the last site that I launched at Kink under the Kink brand. So that will give people an idea of how we, back in the early 2000s, anything right. would stick and flourish if you put work into it. Is that what you attribute that success to is just the time? I think the growth at the time, because then you, I mean, it was still, st I mean, even early 2000s, it was still pretty new as yeah. far as like doing and BDS. I mean, we weren't even allowed to do. Um, like insertion, like penis insertion inside mm -hmm. of someone's body. Like there mm -hmm. was no real penetration with bondage. And I forget when it was we finally did it, but we were we kept talking about it and kept talking about it. And he was like, I, "This is too much of a chance. Like no one's right. doing this." And we're I, and I was like, so "We have to. We have to be the first ones. We can't let those fuckers up in South Ca or South Carolina, San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco, be the first to do this. We yeah. need to do it." So we even started talking about setting up a second company, and I, I would be the CEO, and we always joke that if <laughs> you anything- You take the legal risk. Yeah, I'll take the legal <laughs> risk, but that he, the, the situation was if they ever came for me, that he had to call Uncle Larry, which is what I refer right. to Larry Flint. Right. Because I was like, if anybody can get me out of this, it's going to be him, and since you're the owner, you have the money, you're going to call him. No right, you're going to call him, you're going to pay for it. Right. Yeah. So we kept talking about it, kept talking about it, and we would try and sneak it in here and there, like a little bit. But we didn't push it because we still knew that, you know, that we weren't supposed to be doing it. Yeah. And then there was a court battle or a court win, I should say. Um, what's his name? He's evil. 
Stigliano, is that the name? John Stagliano. Stagliano. Yes. There was a huge owner of Evil Angel. Yes. He, the way I understood it, there was a big court case and with obscenity or something Mm -hmm. like that, he won the case and instantly kink shot up sex and submission because they had had like fucking couples or real fucking couples. Yeah. But this was the first site to shoot. Full sex in bondage. Yeah. And hardcore, we, hardcore sex in bondage. Right. Yeah. And I was like, dude, they're doing it. We have to do it now. So we just, we are so far ahead with all of our other content that mm-hmm. we just paused everything and shot like crazy. So we, as far as I knew, were the second or maybe the third because Chanta showed up and had sure, our, yes. she had her fucked and bound. Yes. So sex and submission, fucked and bound and fucking dungeon all kind of showed up at the same time. And so this is, what is this? This is like late 2000s this is still right? this is still mid so i sh- i showed up in um at two in 2004 in june and this was 2000 mid 2005 2006 at the okay. latest i okay. think it was that we were we were like we got to start doing this it happened mm-hmm. quick because we were like let's launch this site and let's launch this site and let's right. talk about the boy girl but we'll manage this and we'll shoot this and then all of a sudden everything started changing and we were like we have to do it now um which is thinking about it, just the date. Like, that's a long fucking time ago that we started doing that. 2000, yeah. T- yeah. Even if it was 2006, that's still 15 years yes, ago. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. I joke all the time that I, it, I'm i this far from being in this business longer than some of the models have been alive that I'll be shooting. In a couple of years, Oh, yeah, I'll you're be getting fact. very close to that point. But yeah. also, I also feel like I'm getting close to that point. But yeah, you are closer, I am afraid. <laughs> It, you know, one of the weird things, too, of doing this as long as I have, I probably, we were still in the armory the first time it happened, so mm-hmm. it's had to been at least six or seven years ago. Um, we had a model show up, and she was just, <laughs> and I was like, why is she acting so weird around me? And I, because she had been down there talking with the crew, so I was like, maybe there's, they were teasing, and they had something, because we all fucked with each other and played sure. around. So I was like, maybe they're fucking with me. Um, and she finally, I said, hi, I'm JP. She's like, oh my God, I know who you are. And she just all wiggly. And I was like, why are you wiggly and yeah. like this? And it turns out that when she started masturbating, the internet was flourishing because she was so young and I was the guy she had found. So I suddenly had this moment of like, oh I, boy, I need to go. I'll be back in a minute. I forgot <laughs> something upstairs. And I was, I was uncomfortable and didn't know right. how to feel because right. suddenly here's someone who masturbated to me on a regular basis and now was modeling and their little wish foundation was happening yes kind of thing. having a having a fangirl moment right but but it it, it yeah. started to it did it didn't completely subside like even today if i meet someone and they're like oh my god i used to watch your stuff on whatever whatever i'm like oh that's cool and i still have the moment but i, I don't get like flustered to where i'm like i need to I leave gotta go. yeah yeah so <clears throat> so the journey let me not yeah. get distracted yeah yeah the journey so i we did dungeon corp and we ended up launching I think five or six sites that it was just, and it was just him and I. And mm-hmm. then as we launched more and more, we're like, well, maybe we should bring in this person and maybe we should bring in this person. And we ended up getting up to not including John and I, I think we had four or five people that worked for us, which was huge. We had our first really big year where like, when you're looking at the numbers, you're like, holy fuck, we did this as mm-hmm. small as we are. And I kept telling him, I was like, we're, they have to know who we are. Like we may not be, impending on their people but they we aren't this little guy who shoots out of his house anymore like we're we're a force <clears throat> and um it must have been right because the models at this point I was doming all the time I had was I had moved into the director position he was more of just kind of sitting back like he would show up every once in a while and he always oversaw everything mm-hmm. but he was pulling himself further away because I got JP doing this. I got a crew doing this, so I don't have to be there as often. And he right. very much was still on top of it because he was the control guy, so he yeah. had to make sure. Um, and one day I get a call from – actually, I was so, some of my friends in L.A., some of the scene people that I knew that we mm-hmm. used, um, hit me up and said – there's this dude from kink and he wants to talk to you. And I was, and I had seen this hotmail. It was, it was like something, something at hotmail. It wasn't okay. at kink. It wasn't even their name. Sure. And I was like, I see this email and I call bullshit. Plus right. I also, at this point knew uh, my boss well enough to think he's setting me up. Like he's mm-hmm. trying to test my loyalty at right, this point. Right. And that's just the, the paranoia that I have in my, my world and my sure. brain. And it wasn't, um, Super bad, but I was like, I don't trust this, especially if you're going to do, you're, if you're coming at me saying you're kink, you need to come better with than a Hotmail account. 
No offense to Hotmail. No, people. but I feel like even even today, like that's how you know that something is maybe not quite right, is if it doesn't appear to be, you know, at kink.com. Yeah. You know, this is a business. They have business email addresses. Right. But it was legitimate. Yeah. It turned out that he was the new executive producer who had been hired. And the the story I heard, the, the way I heard it was, he got hired, he went and applied, and he was living like in Arizona or something. So mm-hmm. he was mid-move. And by the time I finally agreed to have a conversation with him, he was driving from, he was halfway between Arizona and San Francisco. Mm-hmm. I accepted his call and talked and said, okay, sure, if you're really the guy that's doing the thing, when you actually get to kink, call me then. Yeah. And he called and said, hey, I'm bringing everybody up. There's this pitch, blah, blah, blah. So the story was told to me that he got hired and said, who do you want? There has to be someone else besides this. And then you mm. got Matt Williams and Donna and Tomcat and Marty and all these fucking all these phenomenal people. people. Yeah. And he's like, there's got to be somebody that you have your eye on. And he was like, well, there's this one guy I keep hearing about down in LA. Mm-hmm. And he was like, tell me his name and I'm going to get him. And that was his way to show like puff his chest sure. and be like, I got, I can get I you can whoever you want. I can do this job. So he flew up five or six LA people just to comfort me to show that there was a group of us coming up. And in reality, it seems that he did that just to puff his chest and show that he could do that kind of move. And in reality, he just had only eyes to get me up there to prove mm-hmm. that he could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I went up and they were like, you have to test shoot. We want you to do this. I'm like, no, I'm not showing my face on camera because I, I, which I was, I was very loyal to dungeon Corp. So I'm like, I'm, Oh yes. So you were I'm, showing your face for dungeon Corp. You just weren't, you right. didn't want, I'm not going to test shoot. For, to I love the shot, opportunity. To shoot for somebody else while you still had this job right. in L.A. I had the opportunity, and I thought it was a great opportunity, and I was I needed to check it out, but I also wasn't going to shut that door before this one was open. Right. So there was talks about maybe I could wear a mask or maybe I could be in, like, a full suit to where I was, like, you know, whatever. And I said, let me think about it, and I left. And this was a meeting, or meeting with Peter and the executive producer, and, like, mm-hmm. all of the executives were there trying to convince me to do this. Um, so I was like, let me think about it, and I left. And then a couple of weeks later, John comes up to me, he's like, how was kink? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, act like you don't know what the fuck I'm talking <laughs> about, dude, and I'm going to be pissed. And I was like, dude, I went up there for Folsom, which coincidentally it was. Okay. I was like, I went up there for Folsom, there was a party, I went with Liam, who was an L.A. guy, mm-hmm. and we went and hung out. That's it. And I completely was like, I'm caught. I knew he set me up. Right. He fucking Everything, busted me. Everything, yeah. Turns Everything's out, fucked. Yeah, it turns out some fucking guy who was wanting to basically suck his dick, not figuratively, or figuratively, not... Not literally. Yeah. Yeah. He was um, kissing up to John, and he was like, you know, I saw John. Yeah, and he ran his mouth. So John and I butted heads about it for a minute, and mm-hmm. he's like, this is cool. And, you know, if you're going to go... Oh, that's what it was. They finally offered me a job. Okay. Um. So... He said, if you're going to go, at least help me train up these other people to get them up so you don't, you know, I'm not sitting here holding my ass. Yeah. So I said, okay, cool. And I told him I'd give him two weeks. That's what I had. And okay. I think with within less than five days, it rubbed him the it wrong done, way. Yeah. And he was like, fuck this. And I was like, you know what? Fuck you. Yeah. And we we went our separate ways. We, right. we agreed to disagree, and that was it. Yeah. So I moved up to kink. And yes. It Before was, we get to kink. Okay. I have one more Dungeon Core question. Go. Okay. Um, I want to talk about, so one of the things I want to talk about is how BDSM culture has changed since you started working to now. And so I want to talk about like, who are these girls doing the bikini stuff? Like who are these, who are these okay. models? Where did they come from? What is it like? Like who are these people? Um, we actually were doing Craigslist ads. Really? Because there, okay. there was, there were agencies, but it was few and far between, and we weren't really looking at porn girls at the time because we weren't doing porn. We right. were still doing fetish. Fetish, yes. And we needed a shit ton of variety, especially with just solo girl stuff. So we were like, we need to start looking around. And he and I had never even heard of Craigslist. He was like, we're going to put an ad here. And he started putting ads out, and these girls just started showing up. Fascinating. They were just, ad- just, ran- just random girls. Not- random girls that were willing to do certain things for money and because okay. it wasn't it what you didn't have to be naked there had, didn't right. have to be penetration it eventually we found the groove for that site and mm-hmm. it was always there was the strip tease and then the bondage slowly happened and then mm-hmm. by the time the video came and this is all documented with photos right and then by the time the video came around you were completely tied up with a vibrator and then it was a forced orgasm site okay was there a conversation with these girls about you should have a stage name you're going to be on the internet in this adult material consent etc or was it just like 
come on in. I'm going to write you a paycheck, so you're going to there was do this thing. They knew that it was going to be published on the internet. Okay. But this was also, you know, like with the paperwork that we have currently, the way it's like, here's a limit sheet, and here's right. a this, and here's a 2257. There was, you came in, and there was a piece of paper that said, I blank, fill in your name. Yeah. Um, Swear that I'm over the age of 18 on this date. Period. And that was it. That was fucking it. Fascinating. That was it. So we had people that would show up, and then, then when they showed up, John would say, what are you okay with? You know, here's what we're shooting. Tell me what you're comfortable with. And you had some that were like, I'm cool with bra and panties. Some of them were like, I'm cool with topless. Okay. Less than 10% wanted to take their bottoms off. Okay. And Did they ever come back? Most of them, no. Yeah. Because most of them were fetish models who probably wanted that one gig. And it was a right, good they gig. they wanted that paycheck. Yeah. I assume you guys were paying relatively well. We were, at the time, we actually started looking to see, because we wanted to make, because we no one was, we didn't know anyone that was doing solo. But we knew, this is how much we paid for what seems like a hogtied kink site. Right. This is what we're paying for what seems like the fuck you machines thing. And we, John was always like, let's give them a little more because mm-hmm. we're not as big. Right. <clears throat> so, he... Kind of said, okay, well, if this is this, this is this, then we're going to... in the middle here. This is a good number to go here. And then it kind of, once he found it, and people were like, wait a minute, I can just show up and you're going to put rope on me? And it it was an extreme shit like that. Oh, I imagine it was was damsel in distress kind of hands behind the back, legs tied together, maybe legs tied apart. It was You know, very simple, maybe a ball gag, like very basic bondage. And some some of it was, um, it was just, it was... Yeah, it was some of it. I was like, that's not, that's not bondage. And I was still <laughs> new to it. And I'm like, ah. And John was good. adamant. Like, he, you know, he taught me the basics of bondage. Like, you know, you can't, if you tie someone's hands in front of them, yeah, they can't just sit here. They have to be above the head. Okay. They have to be pulled a- away from, so they can't chew they can't the knot. Just, so the yeah. knot has to go over here, so it's harder for them to put. So right. it always had to be inescapable. Like, you couldn't okay. give them an out, which is weird because we have to tie even now, you still have to tie for sustainability versus right. the, I'm just tying you up. Right. So it has to be loose enough for them to be able to get through a 15 to 20 minute scene, but not loose enough that, that they, they can't can get away. They can fall right out. Right. Yes. Yes. So yeah, they were just, a lot of them were random, but at this point we were slowly making enough of a name that we could call this agent. And he was like, I've got some girl, girl only that would come. Cause mm-hmm. we were like, all right, this is it. Cause it just blew up. And we're like, we don't right. even know why we're doing this, but it's right. doing it. So he started the agents were like I'll send a girl over and then they came in and they met him and I and we were like what can we do for you what do you need and very accommodating and the reputation started happening so people more and more now this agency and this agency and next thing you know you've got the big ones Mm -hmm. that were like fucking you can have our girls right because at the time in adults I feel like it was it was much more taboo to shoot bondage than it is now and so the the a-list girls you know bondage was the thing you did after anal right like in the in as you scale up right like bondage means like oh your career is probably over yeah you've done the gang bang and the double triple whatever right so now we're gonna tie you up even if this tied up experience is just a forced orgasm and you're not actually even on camera with somebody i feel like this is about the time when that started to change right that's when we started um, and again, it was, and I still tell, I preach this to people all the time. Like your reputation in this industry is the most important thing you have. That's your biggest asset. Your body can fluctuate. Your appearances can fluctuate. But if you're, as soon as your, your reputation gets mm-hmm. tarnished, you're mm-hmm. fucked. Mm-hmm. You can, you'll, it's porn. You're going to find a place to still fit. Right. But to, to flourish, I think it's your reputation. Yeah. And it started getting out there that there's these bondage guys and they're fucking treating these models like angels and which is where it started happening because there's specifically this JP guy who's mm-hmm. running this set. Um, and then we had these random new girls, like this girl, this cute little brand new girl called Phoenix Marie showed mm-hmm. up. And then there was other cute Lexi Bell that showed up. Right. And suddenly these at the time were newer girls, but right. they were like, I want to try this in the very beginning of my career instead mm-hmm. of waiting until it was over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it then, really started to, to change, to change things. Right. And it slowly started forming that way. And then, um, it was because when I when we first started booking through agencies and I became the booker, mm-hmm. you would go and you just looked for a girl that was super hot that was doing at least boy girl 
and something dirty because okay. there was no bondage. There was no fetish. Right. No one put that on their agency right. page. Do you, they would put double anal, but they wouldn't put right. fetish or bondage. Yes, because God forbid somebody ties you up. Right. Because right. that's really dirty. That's really scary. That was almost like it's that. really hardcore. Right. That right. was the career killer if right. you did the bondage because, well, the fuck is wrong with you? Right. Double anal was okay, but don't get but tied don't up. But don't get tied up. Yes. I feel like that is a great note to take a commercial break. Perfect. We will be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Do you or your partner desire a pair of smooth hairless balls, but you don't want to bring a razor down there because you don't want to damage your crown jewels in any way? This is where Manscaped comes to the rescue. Their electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0, has proprietary skin safe technology that will not nick or snag your nuts, guaranteed. And plus, they have so many other products to offer. They have stuff like their Crop Reviver and their Crop Preserver, which helps your balls not only smell amazing, but also prevents them from chafing, sticking, or sweating. So if you or somebody in your life wants to up your genital game and you don't want to use the same trimmer that you use on your face down there, make sure that you go to manscaped.com, use code Holly and get 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code Holly for 20% off plus free shipping. And we're back. And we're in San Francisco, I think, now. Are we in San Francisco? Yeah, okay. I think let's talk about San Francisco. And okay. you moved in what year? 2010. November. Okay. I remember specifically because November was, there was the holidays were starting, and I showed up a little before the 15th, but HR was like, hey, this is, we pay every two weeks, right. so we're going to put you starting on the 15th or the 16th. I think it was the 16th, but either way. Yeah. So I showed up. I finally went back and forth with the guy with the Hotmail account, and mm -hmm. he finally had his kink account, right. and we had seen and talked and met. Um, and he calls up, and he was like, so we just had an opening. It's not what you were proposing that you wanted to do, but the guy that was running, which was James Mogul, mm -hmm. um, that was running the upper floor in the training of O, who also created them, Yeah. Um, he walked away. Right. For whatever reason, they, they, they separated. Right. They need someone to run these sites. Immediately. And yeah. I was like, okay, well, when do, we, when do we start? How does this work? And they were like, we're going to send right you contracts. <laughs> and it kind of was. We agreed on money, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and the contract was signed. And I was like, when do I start? And they're like, you already have a ticket. You need to be on a plane tomorrow morning flying out of Burbank. And I was like, okay. When do I fly back? And they're like, you don't. You like, don't. You are employed you, by us now. Right. So but we, I have a life in Los Angeles. I have a life in Los Angeles. Um, I was, I think, newly married at the time. Mm -hmm. I think I had just been married. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I was yeah. married, and we were talking about kid having a kid, but we are like, let's postpone it, because she was still working at a university. I was right. going up there, and I showed up on a plane, um, and or I got on a plane, showed up, and rode in the, the, the shagging wagon or whatever they call yeah. it <laughs> with everyone else, and then got That's there, amazing. and um, I walked up to security, because the armory had, you know, had this fucking right. security. And this was, this was already, Kink had bought the armory. Right. They had already done the renovations and were relatively set up, but right. also relatively new. They were still within the right. first couple of years. So, like, the basement had been drained. But the basement was drained. a bunch of stuff had been built yet. Yeah. The sets were, most of the sets were down there already, and mm -hmm. a lot of the upstairs had been done. But, like, when I got there, the walls were still white on the upper floor. There were okay. no drapes. There was wire that hung from the outlets and then a light bulb because it was, that's what it was. That's what it was, yeah. Um, so it still was coming what it was, but most of the sets were already there. So I got there and I signed off my paperwork and I signed in person my, my contract. And then they made me sign a lease because I had to live in the armory because I, I didn't have an apartment and they made me show up the next day from L.A., so <clears throat> which what floor did you live on? I was on the fourth floor. OK, so the you lived coldest, up there. The coldest place in the winter and the hottest place. In did the you summer. live in that room across from the bathroom? The one that was referred to as Donna's bedroom, yeah. the big one. That yeah. was my bedroom for I was there for <laughs> two and a half, three months. I OK, think. so I was in that bedroom. The bathroom was. So if you remember that room, the bed was all the way in the furthest wall. Right. So I would have to walk through, which is a huge fucking room. Huge room. This was a massive. I mean, for for those of you who didn't go to the armory, which I feel like is most of the people listening to this. Right. Massive building. It was 250,000 square feet. And built in 
18 something it was right after the earthquake so it was early 19 early 19 so so very much kind of an unusual old old floor plan you know right. big staircase up the center one unit of bathrooms and plumbing on each floor essentially on each side on each yeah because they were yeah, long like hallways. right there long big long hallways so yeah and then one of and i remember because all of the because all of the Doors were pretty original for the mm-hmm. most part because it was a historic building, so yes. you couldn't go fucking changing a lot of stuff. Yes. Um, and so they put me in the room, and there's the double doors, and it was like Captain Major something, and no offense to anybody that's military. I know I just fucking gummed that up, but it was whatever their title mm-hmm. was, that was their quarters. Right. Um, because it was originally, it was a armory for the Coast Guard, I think. I think. I, I think, think it was Coast, Coast Guard. Guard. Um, and of course, then it sat empty. I think for like thirty five, forty years. A very long time, yeah. And and decayed. And yeah. one of the things that Peter did when he bought the armory was revitalize it and restore it. Uh, yeah, as, as better than probably it. Well, I wouldn't say better than it was, but it was it was pretty damn nice. It was beautiful. It was be all original marble and all of these ori- you know original doors, like you were saying, yeah. original windows, just very there were very still like nicely original cabinets restored. that were still there. Yeah, some so incredibly beautiful things. Right. So I walk out of the big ass room and mm-hmm. it's fucking freezing. Right. And I have to walk across. And the hallway was probably twenty or thirty feet wide. It was massive. Yes, and made military. of marble. Made right? of marble. There so was marble freezing. trim. There was the whatever the walls were made of, but then there was yeah. marble trim freezing. all around, and the w- floors were some kind of was I don't know if they were maybe marble. I think the fl- I, I want to say the floors were also marble, and it was like marble up the walls. Right. So I have to go across, and then there's the fucking huge bathroom that's mm-hmm. got to the stalls and the urinals. Mm-hmm. So it's like I. I Freeze. slept in a robe with yeah. pajamas on and like three big dish heaters. Yeah. So I, I learned to sleep in a bright orange glow. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm up there and I go straight to work. And the first thing I did, like as soon as we started negotiating, is I, I went and I told him I need a subscription so I can see because those were the surprisingly the two sites that I didn't really give a shit about. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, great. You're going to give me the ones I don't care about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started studying James Mogul. Like I knew James Mogul better I think than most people did because I studied everything. I studied all of his, all of the, the, the documents that he had online. Cause at one time the upper floor was so intricate that it had yes. all of these documents and rules. And, um, so I studied him and studied him and I was like, I love this about him. I, this, I could, and I didn't dislike, I just didn't care. I'm like, whatever. Right. I don't, I don't, I'm going to change this. I'm yeah. going to change this. And, I'm gonna, and I sat and changed all these things. And he was very much story of, Oh, mm-hmm. very BDSM DS kind of trainer. Where I was, I'm cool with that, but I'm more military. I'm more aggressive. I'm a, a sadist by nature. So I was like, we're going to do this my way. Um, so we changed some things around. I turned it to where the training of O now fed the upper floor. So right. it wasn't the same slaves. They would rotate. Um, we set up a camera system on the upper floor. I think there were 12 cameras that ran for free at, all day long, 24 mm-hmm. hours a day, which to me still sucks because we never monetized it. Like there were. It, Wait, any, it wasn't, it, you didn't have to have a membership? To those watch were, those cameras? Those 12 were free. And I was like, we, when oh, we first launched I had, that. I didn't know that. Yeah. It fucking, I still cringe. Like I get chills oh, just yeah. trying to be calm God, about it. Yeah. Um, and I told him, I was like, you know, I would log in because, you know, you just didn't, you didn't go to work, clock in, clock out, and you didn't care. It was your website. You were responsible. If it went down, you were the one in the middle of the night calling IT going, right, what the fuck? Right. So, um. I would log in and just check. And you could log in at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and there were five to 600 people chatting in there. And they sta- and it was empty rooms. Right. They're watching nothing because the girls are asleep. Right. Um, and it was basically we had this experiment going on. We put ourselves in a fishbowl. Um, the models, the cameras, certain cameras went off, too, for privacy. Sure. Um, and then 10 a.m., Monday through Friday, the cameras came on in the quarters, mm-hmm. the, the slate quarters. Mm-hmm. And I showed up in my uniform. I had this suit suit with pinstripes on it. Um, and I walked in, and we did inspection every fucking morning. Right. And we would inspect their beds, inspect their clothing. We'd turn them around because it was porn. So yeah. And it was all for the free cam. It was This was <laughs> all for the, We didn't record any of this. But we had a ritual. And that's <laughs> I, how I we, always thought you had to be a member of the site to watch those mm-hmm. cameras. No. I, that's, I asked, but they were like, no, that's how we keep people coming. I'm like, no, that's how you keep people getting oh. free. Okay. And we I would mean, leave them on when we did when we did shoots. We would leave them on, but there was no zooming close up. You right. still had this big surveillance wide, yeah. so you didn't really get to see, but you felt like you were part of it. Yeah. Um, and there were there were these rules, and because we had them in the hallways, and we had them in the slave quarters, and we had them in the the dining room, and mm-hmm. in the kitchen, mm-hmm. and in the, all over the fucking place. There were like two or three safe zones, and the rest of it was on camera. Right. Um. So people were watching all the time. 
And I don't know where I was going with that. Either way, it was yes. the, the experiment was just, it was insane because we had so many people watching us all the time. We would do the, ins- that's what it was. We'd do the inspections. Right. And if I was walking down the hallway and I, cause I would come in, I would put my suit on and we were in, I was in character until I would leave. And like, there's photos of me sitting in the basement talking with our, our uh, set director or mm-hmm. set designer. Mm-hmm. And I'm still wearing the fucking zoot suit. I always had the zoot suit on unless I was dressed like how, I am now. How many suits did you have? How many identical suits? I actually only had one of each. I had a pinstripe and a solid black. And you just rotated. I just rotated through them. Um, Which, yeah, I had what I did have was several ties and several shirts. So that changed. But the rest of it would basically get hung on a hanger in my office and just basically air out. Yeah. (laughs) And then when I started to feel like it was. That's why I was asking. Yes. was like, how how gross was this? When it got gross, if there was ever a shoot, I would send it to the cleaner and put the black one on or, or vice versa. Yeah. Um. So, but like, yeah, well, we'd walk down the hallway because we had this thing that, that Mogul had started. And then mm-hmm. I went in and kind of redid with Stefano. So we right. changed all the rules to fit what we were doing. We had to abide by these rules if we were to be believable. Right. And since everyone was watching, we had to, you had to, work yeah, in. you had to live that life. Right. So if I'm walking down the hall and one of the girls saw me, their thing was to stop hands behind the back, mm-hmm. legs get spread at shoulder length, and they face the fucking wall so that they didn't disrespect right. the master of the house. Right. And it was, it it started as this fun porn thing, and it turned into, like I said, this it was almost a social experiment because these girls became so dependent on me because mm-hmm. I was I was boyfriend, I was dad, not right. daddy. And I guess I was daddy, you too. You were also daddy, I think. I was daddy, I was the dad, I was the boyfriend, I was the therapist, yeah. I was all of these things. And there got to a point because I always said this 24 seven psychologically doesn't seem to make sense. You have to be, you can be 23, yeah. six or something, but right. it's hard to stay that way. And just with us doing that eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week, mm-hmm. there was, I still have a, an incredible bond with these girls. Right. I still, these women, Yeah. Um, they still call, most of them still call me daddy. I don't care what relationship they're in. That's just, that's the way that's we're probably always yeah. going to be. Yeah. Um, and I adore all of them because we, we went through so much. I put those girls through hell, but it was we, and I got into it. Like I started becoming like when we would go with in public with my wife and we would go to a nicer restaurant and Mm -hmm. if someone served food improperly because we were so much about etiquette, I would fucking critique them. And she got to a point where she's like, I don't like going to dinner (laughs) with you. She was very tired of that. I'm sure that that was not awesome. No, she was sick of it really quick. She's like, please stop terrorizing. Can we have a family dinner please? Because I would. I'm like, do you see the way these fucking ties hang in? His tie's not even fucking long enough. He t- <laughs> Or did you see the way she fucking put that in front of me and showed me? Because you don't show the back of the hand. It's disrespectful. So you serve. I'm just to go. Right. Yeah. And there were all of these things. And because I had prog- I knew them because I had to teach you, the girls, yeah. I fucking became this ass about it. Um, but then it got to where we couldn't do what we called service sessions, which was we did every Monday and Wednesday. And then mm-hmm. Friday or Saturday, there was a party. Right. And the service sessions, I would walk in, and the girls had to sit. They were on their knees. They had the positions they were supposed to be. They had mm-hmm. to memorize all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And there was, it got to a point where I would walk in to start the service session, and ca- we're live. Cameras right. are rolling. Right, right. And I'd walk in, and one, two, three, fuck. There goes four. Within a minute, they all started crying because they knew they had fucked up because mm. Stefano's had a book. Stefano's walked yeah. around when I was in the basement and watched them. He'd sit on his computer right. and watch them slipping, and – you take notes and they knew when it came service time that I knew everything. Every, yeah. And they would, would, like I said, it got so bad and like into their head. And I'm not even sure that this was, this was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for me trying sure. to maintain this. And it had gotten to the point emotionally that it was fucking with them. So it was, yeah. it was still consensual. How, how healthy in the long run. Yeah. yeah. It, it got to where it was, it was almost unhealthy because right. they were so, because they were performing and, but the mental part was he is mm-hmm. master. So I have to right. be good to him. Right. So it got to where it was getting unhealthy mm-hmm. and they would, like I said, one, two, three, four, within a minute, this one started yeah. crying because she knew she may have been the one who slipped the worst. Yeah. This one was this afraid one, yeah. for her. Exactly. And then it all, yeah. Right. And so we started, like, I saw it happening and I started, I like, I went to Peter and I was like, I've got to pull back. Like we have to do, this is getting. Right. This is turning into a problem. Yeah. And it's getting to where it was. And we stopped it. It never got bad. Yeah. That, it never got super bad. Yeah. So we, I was like, we have to rotate more. We can't keep these girls here this long, even though they're willing, we right. have to because rotate they more. were living at the armory 
some of them were they had their possessions there and they spent a shit ton of time but officially no one actually really lived sure, there. Sure, they weren't they weren't like legally renting rooms, right. but they might as well have been from from what I understand they yeah. they might as well have just lived there. It was there there were a couple of them but that was definitely their that secondary. That was their life. Yeah, that was their life. They were there. They had shit stored away because they they'd spent so much sure. time there that after hey, I'm clocking out on the afternoon of Friday and I've just got, I've got my stuff here. I'm going to shower and go straight to my party and then I'll go right. to my apartment later. Right, but they didn't really take other work, right? No, they were contracted they, to right, just be they there. Right, they worked. They, this, was, this was their life. Right, exactly. And this role play turned into... It started, it started taking an more effect. More than that, yeah. yeah. Which is why we saw it, we pulled back, and we reassessed and was like, this is... It's not good for me because yeah. I've never been this person who needed to instruct or needed to command or demand people treat me a certain way and somehow i've gotten into this mindset and i was like this isn't who i am right and they were so like we have to make sure daddy's happy yeah and it got it got rough it got in a it was a weird spot but we luckily we all pulled away and we all are all for the most part socially acceptable yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah i haven't actually i feel like i've spoken to quite a few of the women who did this job and I haven't spoken to anyone who's been like, yeah, that was abusive. Yeah, that was terrible. It's just like, this was hard. Like this was hard. This was right. This was a commitment to something that I did for this amount of time. Right. The hardest part, I think, and they, there was always this running joke that they said, if there was the one thing, and I, like I said, I did some, when I say horrible, I'm talking torture stuff. I'm not right. like, abusive. Uh, no, uh, horrible in the, I got really creative. Sadistic. Right. Mental or physical consensual way right. yeah. like knowing exactly how long you could have you your feet submerged up to the ankle in ice before frost frostbite would set in and right. that's those were punishments like it was just i had to get creative because it was constantly doing the thing yeah but they said of all of the shit that i did to them the one thing that they would never forgive me for was the virgin because we had oh we, i know i know what you're yeah. talking about so that was the one thing because she yeah had all of this people looking because of the live shoot that we right. did um, and then, so she had this, I'm this person and thought that there was mm-hmm. a little slip and slide that they could do. Mm-hmm. And the other girl's like, this is bullshit. She's yeah. the same thing She's, we are. Yeah. So there was never like this hazing, like in my head, I always kind of not fantasized, but like s- jokingly thought like they got socks with bars of soap and they're kicking her ass when I'm not there, which never happened. Yeah. Never happened. Yeah. But so that was the one thing they're like, if you could have just left her. To right. not come in here and fuck up the beauty that we had, right? But it was it was also but it very was short-lived. also I know that there was also some, yeah. The dynamic of that was the rest of them took it yeah. extremely serious, and she kind of was like, "Ha ha!" And it was, she can didn't I, take it. Can serious. Can I clarify for people listening yeah. what we're talking about? So we're talking about. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about. I don't actually remember her name, but the the girl who it's came. Best that you don't. The girl. It's in the back of my head somewhere because I watched this shoot. Yeah. Pre me getting into porn, I for sure watched this. Right. But the girl who came to lose her virginity on the upper floor. Right. Yes. She's changed her name since then, but it was a live thing. Yes, live live on camera. She had been fucked in the ass, but she was going to... She did anal. She did yeah. blow. She had blow. been doing porn. She, she wasn't just, like a brand new girl, but she still had her hymen if you want to define virginity by that kind of nonsense way. Which is why we changed the name from losing her virginity to, we called it the deflowering of Nikki... Nikki, something, whatever. Her, she's changed her name since then. It has a color in it, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's not red, white, black, orange, or yellow. Right. And it starts with a B and ends mm-hmm. with a Lou. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot, but yeah, that was her name. It's that since was her changed. name. That, yeah, I th- she, um, that's my understanding that she wasn't necessarily like that. She, um, yeah, she yeah. wasn't the sharpest tool in the box, so to speak. She was very much there, and I, because I'm so hardcore about consent, if I ever would have thought for a minute that she wasn't right. mentally capable of consenting. Right. And there was, I never saw, but the executive producer said that they actually did a mental evaluation because they're like, this isn't something that most people want to do, right. is lose their virginity in front yes. of. I think we had close to 500 people so attending the party. Crazy thing. I watched this shoot while I was still a virgin, and I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it too. I'm going to lose my virginity on camera. And then when I was actually at a place in my life where it was time to have sex and I was emotionally ready to have sex and with someone and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it on camera. Right. He was like, don't don't be an idiot. You, your first time at least should be with someone you like. Well, and and I was like, well, that's fair, I guess. Right. But 
that it was very much a thing that like was part of my sexuality was this particular situation. Right. So see, there you go. Yeah. Apparently, I influenced and you. And this was <laughs> what was this? Twenty ten. Yeah, probably twenty ten, early twenty eleven. Maybe maybe late. So if I'm gonna put this in my timeline, I bet you this shoot came out late twenty ten, early twenty eleven. Yeah. If I put this like in my very distinct timeline of becoming right. an adult. <laughs> but yeah, I think yeah. that's when it was. I think it was. But you know what? A lot of people, we caught a lot of slack because they're like, I can't believe you're taking advantage of this poor girl. There's no possible way anyone in their right mind would want to do this. Right. And I and what I did, and I had so many people after it was done that worked the, and kink who were kind of like, this, who's this fucking new guy who's deflowering, deflowering someone? somebody like on live, live on cam. Yeah. Um, which I still think I might be the only one that ever did that. And it may not be my proudest It's maybe moment. the only, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe somebody else has done it. Right. But in terms of being on a major scale that we did. Website, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, there were so many people at that party. There were hundreds of people at the party and thousands. It was the biggest, like it broke every record that Kink had ever had for streaming. Which and is no a one whole different topic that like the deflowering shoot was the big one. Right. It's like a whole different conversation. But so I had everyone downstairs that were like, mm, and putting their nose up, like, what the fuck is this new guy trying to prove? Like, he comes in and he rearranges the, the train of O, he installs mm-hmm. all these fucking cameras, mm-hmm. and now he brings a virgin. Like, this, right. what is this, a sacrifice? What's going right. on? And after the shoot, and they all watched it because they were like, this motherfucker's gone. They, like, he's going to yep, do some shit, and they're going to get him. to crash and burn. And one by one, that following Monday, they either emailed or came up, and they were like, I, can I talk to you for a minute? And I'm like, fuck, they're going to get me. And yeah. One after the another, they were like, I can't believe how tasteful you did that, how respectful it was. And I was like, they like me. They really, really <laughs> like me. Well, because all of these people were people you looked up to. Right. And it's, but these were also like, you know, the head of IT who mm, I, again, mm-hmm. looked up to because it's right. empire big, that I was Yeah, big, with. big, ma- massive empire. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was, I think at its, at its the glorious day was, I think there was over 150, 160 people working in that building. Yeah. Including crew and everybody else. Right, everybody, all the support staff, all everybody. Right. So, and all of a sudden I was like, fuck, I didn't, I was very much flexing. Like, I had to come in and show people I was, I meant business when I was coming. And that just happened to figuratively fall in my lap that there's this girl who wanted to do this. Right. But on the other hand, when I started thinking about it, we all were virgins at one point. And Mm -hmm. for the most part, I think most people that are listening, if they probably are not anymore. And you, it's. With sure, but whatever. at some point, everybody is. Everybody That's how is, it goes. and everyone loses it. And right. from my experience and anyone that I've spoken to, none of us have this, like, oh, it was so romantic, and it was so good, and it was so... Most uh, of it I is awkward. And, okay, well, maybe yours is better. But I for the most part, I, it's awkward and weird. So I knew what I wanted. Okay. And I choreographed it. Which is what she did. Yeah. I knew what I wanted. I knew that I wanted it to be a certain way. Right. And I... Didn't lose my virginity until I was 21 because I choreographed it. Right. And I waited until I met the right person who could execute the thing that I wanted it to be. Right. Which is, uh, it, that's applaudable because, like I said, most people are like, first, I got my first chance, I'm going to take it. Right. And it, like I said, for the most part, and not always, but for the most part, and from people I've spoken with, it's usually awkward and weird. And the, it, sex is still that way now. You still oh sure, sex. And, yeah, you make funny noises with your body parts right. and shit. Yeah. So she, and this is the way I told people, she was able to say that there are three men, and it wasn't just any three rant, which it could have been, but it was Jack Hammer, mm-hmm. Mark Davis, and James, and James Dean. Dean. She handpicked exactly who, who she, she wanted, wanted, and there wasn't going to be this. Ooh, sorry, that never happens to me. And the bump, right. like you had fucking professionals who were going to be calm, calm and right, and give her what she wanted. How are they? How were they emotional? Were they were they weirded? Were they uncomfortable? They were the most giving and compassionate of the entire because I had to choreograph and I almost felt like a ringleader like back the fuck up right people, hundreds of people yeah, surrounded I, just, I remember on that video just like there was no breathing room in that room yeah and it was hot as fuck well it, it was, got very hot in that room and it smelled and it wasn't like because people. there was yeah just people There's people people and sex yeah yeah and there was patience like I think that was I think I feel like she was she yeah she was the one who actually came up with the idea that I'll let the the, the public pick I'll let the, the members pick who is going to do it okay and I forget who the first one was but whoever the first one was 
tried and tried and i guess she had like because we had a doctor on hand just to right, be safe right that she apparently had like a fucking hymen of steel <laughs> and there was this because all of them were well endowed yeah none of them wanted to physically right hurt no one her. wanted to injure her right they wanted yeah. this to be a beautiful moment even right. though we were on the upper floor and there were all these people she watching could still be beautiful right yeah and so uh, when i tell people that i was like she got to as you did choreograph and right. pick exactly how it went down so how can you no one took advantage. She was the yeah. one who came to us. She was the one that had the idea, and we basically facilitated it. And I'm sure people are still going to be like, "Well, you blah blah blah," but right, doesn't doesn't matter. This is whatever, whatever. Right. Yeah. And it was, and it was, it's you know, it was a cool thing that happened. It was cool to be part of it to see these, you know, Jack and Mark and James, who were all known as like really aggressive, hardcore tops, to be so gentle and and mm -hmm. affectionate to make sure. She had exactly, and if they're like, she winced, uh, uh, yeah. and it would fuck with their heart on. Like I gotta yeah. pull back. So they would all, they basically all kind of did it. I don't even remember which one actually. I don't actually remember. Fully did. I don't remember. But then once it happened, there was everybody's like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That's what I remember is like the dick went in, and it was like yes, and, and it was this big celebration, right. and then she got fucked. Yeah, and then every then they took their turns, and it turned into a porno. It's exactly. It turned like from this whole big tension filled thing to like we're making a porno. Right. It yeah. went from like what the fuck's going on to holy shit they did it and it was beautiful and yeah. oh now there's the porn. Right. Cuz I don't think anyone felt it pornographic until the mo yeah. th then the sex had finally yeah. started happening in the vagina and then they're like oh, oh okay. Okay, we can make porn now. We are here to make pornography. Right. And before right. that it there was this event that was part of it. Right. So um yeah. Yeah. That was, and, and I still kind of joke, I was like, I hope that at the end of my career that my defining moment wasn't the virgin. Not that I, I, I regret it. I still love that it happened. Sure. But I don't want it to be like, he's the guy who did the virgin, not all of the other things I've yes. done. Yes. Okay. Well, let's take a commercial break and okay. then we'll talk about the things that you'd like to be defined by. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. And we're back. All <laughs> let's, right. <laughs> let's, okay, so I feel like, again, putting things into my timeline okay. of my experiences, not that long after this shoot, you started working for other sites. Right. By the time I started really working for Kink, although my first... Yeah, I think my first device bondage, you had taken over the site, but I was with the guest director. Okay. Was my first device bondage, which was December of 2011. I, at the time, well. Right, 2011? 2011, yes. I hadn't 2011. taken it over yet. I still. Okay. The way mine worked. Or is no, I, maybe it was Matt and it was the it guest Matt director. It may have been Matt in Orlando. Because I think Matt was officially the director in 2011. Orlando okay. was the one who was running it. But right, but I worked with Sarge. Yeah. The Sergeant Major. Sarge, when Sarge would call Kink he and say, hey, I'm coming into director, town. Yeah. And we'd kind of spread him around and give him all the work. Yeah, and I think they gave me to him because I was an unknown, untested performer. And they were just like, here's this girl. So we're going to fly her in from Florida. 
Oh, Let's you see what happened. I was still in Florida. I hadn't. I wasn't doing hardcore yet. Okay. Um. I just really wanted to work for Kink because, like, was, yeah. Empire, as we were saying. Right. Um. We. I. So I did about two years. I think it was a, a month or so shy of two, or a month mm-hmm. or so past two years that I ran an upper floor and training of O. And then we had this thing, which I can talk about now because it's kind of it was. There was a secret, like, oh, there's JP's leaving and going to Twisted Factory, and they're right. relaunching Twisted Factory, right. and JP's going to rebrand. And in reality, we were in the armory. Yeah. We built new sets But upstairs. Twisted Factory was its, like, separate little It was very much a separate thing. Yeah. I had one person in IT, mm-hmm. or maybe one and a half, if they had the time, dedicated to Twisted Factory, and I had one person in marketing who, coincidentally... My person in marketing also knew enough coding that she started helping me with my sites to make them look the way I wanted. Mm -hmm. And then she eventually moved into IT. Right. Then she became the head of IT, and now she runs the fucking place. Now she's the CEO. So her and, yes, she is now the CEO. (laughs) So it's it's funny how her and I have I didn't realize you've known her for that long. I've known her since she was working in marketing and starting to try and move into IT. Yeah. And she was the one who, like, like... Single hand, well, not single handedly, but for 99% of the single handedly did, yes, help bring Twisted Factory up, right? Because so if there was a problem, she was the one that I would go to. You were still running the upper floor in December of 2011, yes. I was at one of your parties, see, that was my first upper floor party. But I have d- excellent memories from that party, <laughs> boy. Oh, boy, <laughs> that was my first threesome. Oh, that was my first ever life threesome ever Maybe in have life. To flip this around and talk about your journey. <laughs> But the funny thing about the upper floor is even people in the building at some point thought that Stefanos was the director for the upper floor because okay. I am not, look at me. Right, and he has always been, what is his, what is his official? His official. His major domo, right? Is no, that I was major domo, major domo, which was master of the house. Right. Master of, yeah, I think master of the house. He was the steward, which yeah. there was, I forget exactly what his thing was, but he was basically the... The, the, he, it was his job to bring in the people. Well, it was his job to do that, but his as, as far as his hi- house title, he was in charge of, I was in charge of the entire house and right. all of the staff, whether right. it was the higher-up staff or whether it was the slaves. Um, and he was basically in charge of watching. He kept the slaves in mm-hmm. line. Your uniform has to be yeah. perfect. Let me show you how to do it. So he kind of was... He was, I, I guess, essentially more of the daddy to the slaves right. than I was. Like your, like your right hand. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and but he was this, and still is this fucking yes. larger than life human who is phenomenal with people, and he's uh, so like involved with the the actual lifestyle scene. Mm-hmm. So he knew all of the all people, these people, that and they came in. in and they were like, "Oh, Stefanos, uh, you emailed me about this party, and I'm on right. your guest list," and right. so. I think he still actually retains his guest list. It, is, that was it is my understanding that it is his it always guest was. list. It doesn't belong to Kink. It doesn't belong to the upper floor. It is his, his guest and list. And he's had it for so many for, years. And, and it's long and full of amazing people. Right. And it was great because you got you got to bring the lifestyle in yes. along with the porn that portrayed yes. the lifestyle. So there was this great mix. But he, like I said, he was larger than life. Everyone loved him. And he loved to be the center. Like, he loved that people listened and yeah. talked and wanted to interact yeah. with him. Um, so he, I was like, here, you be the face. I'll be the enforcer. Like, I don't have to be, listen to me. I'm going to, I would stand next to him, like, where however I would stand. And I right. would, we would already have talked about what was going to happen. And he would command the camera. The camera would, person would come over, aim it at him, and he would make the announcement. And this mm-hmm. is the thing. And this is the way, mm-hmm. this is what's up next. And people fucking adored him. Yeah. And I just was the guy who did the bondage for Stefanos, mm. which was great. I had no problem with sure, that. Sure, sure. That actually doesn't seem like a, a terrible position to be right. in. You let him be the face and the grandiose guy, and you do the work. Right. Yeah. And then James, we were talking about, you know, the numbers aren't where we want to see them, and, you know, times change. Right, Sites times close. change, stuff changes. You move up to a Different sites. Right. James comes back and James takes comes over back. training of O in the upper floor. Right. And you move to... I started Twisted Factory with right. Sadistic Rope and what was fucked and bound, and we rebranded Dungeon Sex. Right. And then... And then those sites kind of... I want to jump forward a little bit so this okay. interview isn't five hours long because right. we could just sit here and talk all day. Right. You moved around a bit, I feel like. Right. You, you moved around to a bit of different sites. Right. I went training of O, upper floor... 
sadistic rope and dungeon sex mm -hmm. and then there was um i guess directed a couple of times for sex and submission mm -hmm. and then device bondage became mine right i kind of i did a substitute stint to where i ran it for like three months because they were in between directors um and then i took device bondage mogul had hogtied and yeah. then mogul moved to something else and then i ended up with hogtied and device right. bondage and right. fucking machines and fucking machines Right, because after you took fucking machines over after Tomcat left. Right. Yeah. So I. Yeah, just lots of lots of move, but that's how companies work, and big companies right. work. Things move around, and and things change, and then again, I like the girls, the models. Right. Changing. Constantly, I joke with um, Disco is what we call him, mm -hmm. my videographer who I've been working with the longest. Like I think at this, I think we were we're either in our seventh or eighth year of working yeah, together very now. Long time. And. Um, he actually, I think he was the one that came up with the analogy and I really liked it, was it? it's like being in the industry because he just started his 18th year. So being in the industry as long as we have, it's being like a, like a college professor. Like mm -hmm. you have this new mm. freshman class that shows up, you watch them progress, some of them stick around and do well, some of right. them barely get through it, right. and then you have the stars. You have the, the, the valedictorian mm -hmm. and the, the really high achievers. And then... They slowly, one by Everyone one, moves away, away, moves and changes. Yeah. And then there's the new class. Right. And then you watch because there's always new people showing up. But there's those group that like this is, you know, this mm -hmm. is. This is the current generation. This is the Casey Calverts. And then back then there was like this is the Harmony and mm -hmm. uh, the Jezebel Bonds, you know. Mm -hmm. So we've constantly people seen these classes and, and graduating. Yeah. So you have yeah. this like, and as, as at our age, we very much have this like fatherly kind of right. like. Let me show you and help you get through this kind of thing. So it's kind of weird being around that long and seeing model, model, model. But it's also great yeah. to see them go from coming in and watching them go places that you yeah. never even thought they could go. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about that. I feel like everybody wants to talk to you these days about consent. And I feel like you just right. gave me a really nice lead in about <laughs> being a fatherly figure. And I wasn't actually going to do it, but you set I me up. It. You set me up. So let's talk about – talk about – developing consent as it has led you into like now and 2021 from like from we're so like we're i don't know we're we're in 2012 okay and as it has led you to now um it's always been like even from the get go it was always a big thing like it was i when I'll even go back further, when I used to, before I knew what BDSM was, mm -hmm. I used to fantasize and I told very few people this because I didn't want people to think, oh, great, I'm right. friends with a psycho. Yeah. But I was like, they were like, if, what's the craziest thing you ever thought about doing? I was like, well, I want to tie someone down. And the bondage didn't even matter. I just didn't want them to leave. Right. And then I would think of the most fucked up thing I could do to hurt them, like razor blades up the bottom of the feet, mm -hmm. slowly peeling eyelids off. And I'm not even into that kind of shit. Right, but just all like I wanted fantasy, entirely fantasy based things. Well, it was the, the the thing was is it was the intensity. I wanted to put someone in the most excruciating pain possible so mm -hmm. I could look at their face and watch them suffer and beg for it to stop. But then I always finished with but then afterwards I can pat it off, no one's bleeding, everyone right, feels okay, and we go fine. have a beer. Yeah. And what I just described was BDSM morbid porn. BDSM porn. Yeah. So you, I never really wanted to cut people's feet or rip their eyelids out, right. but what I wanted to do was watch people suffer. And that's when I was like, oh, but I thought I was weird, so I didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Turns out I'm just a good old sadist. Right, right. Turns out that's actually relatively Right, and it always had to normal. be. yeah. It always had to be everything's okay at the end. I never had. I, there's you didn't want to be a murderer. Right. You wanted to play this game. Because I have actually a conscience. I, I, I right, feel but you're not actually a psychopath. Like <laughs> right. Like I get very aroused if we push to a point where there's, there's tears or there's really like the, Oh my God. Cause in the back of the head, all the girls know they're safe and right. I will stop as soon as they say, right. But, but the, the game is real fun. The game is hot as fuck. Yeah. Like yesterday with the belt thing. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that real was fun. fun. Yeah. Real fun. Um, so I always knew that it had to be okay. Like if you and I were talking and you were crying because God forbid something bad was happening in your life, it would tear me apart. I'd probably be like, right. It wouldn't okay. be, yeah, it wouldn't be, a sex thing. Right. Yeah. There's nothing sexy about real suffering and anguish. But consensual and playing, mm -hmm. no matter how extreme, because, I mean, I do the waterboarding. We have right. marks on your body. Sure, sure. So that's always been in the back of my head. But over time, I have, I, for a while, things would happen and I saw them. But because of the power dynamic of who was involved, mm -hmm. I would, I had to kind of stand by. And it made me feel like shit. And I, 
I'm never going to let that happen again. Right. And it got to a point to where I am now. Well, even then, like when I moved to kink, there was, there was even more of an emphasis on it. So I was like, okay, there's this and this and this. Mm -hmm. And I've constantly been like, it's always like before anything else, there has to be consent. Mm -hmm. I stopped shooting certain models because they would go into this orgasmic bliss. Right. And they kind of were gone. Mm -hmm. They were so subbed out. And I would sit there and talk to them, and they would be like, Whoa, what's what? go- yeah, what's going on? Where am I? And they, yeah. were, they weren't there. And yeah. I was like, this isn't consent anymore. Yeah. Like, as soon as they checked out, I had to stop. Right. And then I was like, and the, the more, there were a couple of them that you shot, the deeper they would go and the faster they would get there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can't shoot you. Like, I'm... Right, I, I got need my you hands just on. stay with me, which was one of like the very early lessons I learned being a model was like whatever you do, don't go away. Right, because you you there you can twilight if mm-hmm. you will, you can kind sure. of dance that line, but you and still you can have feel to feel real good, right? Yeah, and it's okay once we get to a point to, uh, that I can let you go. But if we're in the here's the thing, if we're playing, mm-hmm. and I know that what I do, and I've had plenty of models tell me this that it's therapeutic for them. Sure. Sometimes it's just because they want it. Sometimes it's because they're stressed. Sometimes they've lost a person that they really care about and they just need to get the devil out. Right. But they're always, and there's the therapy, but if you show up and you are so damaged that I, you need me to beat the shit out of you and you fade away instantly. I'm not the therapist for you. I'm not the guy. So, and there's been models that I I was like, I can't do this. Like I, I just can't, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be the person who, at this point, perpetuates whatever damage you already have. So it's always been, and as I've grown through this, like doing all of this, I've gotten mm-hmm. more and more like strict about how before that's okay because I'm keeping an eye on them to right. where it's like there's now very like no, 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 no. Yeah. And like I said, we'll play. I'll get you know we'll I'll sure. get hard as fuck, but sure. you need to be present with yeah. me during the time. And then when we get to the reward, if you want to roll your eyes back and you want to check out then during the orgasm. We've already established that that's all okay. But I'm still going to make sure you're still there because right. I, the last thing I want is them to be, you know, anybody be like, well, he was fingering me and I, I wasn't, well, so. Right, right. But the conversation <clears throat> about this is what we're going to do today, we're going to do this if we're just going to talk about hogtied. Right. We're going to tie you up, going to hurt you a little bit, then I'm going to make you come. Right. That has already been lined out and consented to. Right. And then there's the check-in afterwards that we do, right. which is, I think, why... And a safe word. Right, and there's safe words. Um, but there's also, there's accountability on my part. And I, you know, I've, I've worked with models who call me, you know, a week or so later and like, hey, I've got this numb spot. And I was like, when did it happen? Because we all kind of, and I start oh, thinking, sure. I'm like, and they, and it's always, if I didn't know about it on set, it's because the model's like, I was having too much fun and I didn't want to tell you. And then it makes me mad because I'm like, that's not fair to me. Right. And it's not that I mind saying, here's my, you know, here's the the, um, workman's comp. Let me pay for your doctor because it happened on my set. It happened while you were working with me. I'll cover it. But what bothers me is that, like, I can only be so, sorry, my stomach keeps rumbling. You're fine. (laughs) It's Um, lunchtime. I can only be so responsible. I can watch you and I can see your mannerisms and I can watch your body and I can touch your flesh and I can know this is getting too cold or Mm -hmm. that's too purple or you're not where you're comfortably you're supposed to be. But there's certain things that I still need you to hold responsibility mm-hmm, over. Mm-hmm. And again, this if it happens, I'm like, I, you're going to have to prove to me that I can trust you. Because if right. I can't trust you to speak up and advocate for yourself, I can't consciously say I'm going to shoot you because I can't guarantee that I can't consent to you possibly not consenting. Right. It's very much a two-way street. Right. And I feel like these days, just within the past couple of years – models and and porn stars who do BDSM whether they do it in their personal life or just this is something that they do for the camera right have learned about not to go into sub space and oh I can actually have limits and say no to these things right. and I and I actually it's okay for me to be on a BDSM set and say hey my hands going numb right where I feel like even when I started like if you said like hey my hands going numb well, that was very encouraged. Maybe like that meant you were a little weak or like you're kind of a pussy and why aren't you just taking it? Right. Don't you want to take it? Aren't you supposed to be so hardcore? And now what makes you hardcore and what makes you great at the job is the active communication. Right. And the details and the limit sheet. And I that was as you were saying that there was a model that was one of the upper floor girls. Mm-hmm. Um, her name was Iona Grace. Mm-hmm. And when she started, there was nothing. 
nothing that she would not do. Right. And then she took a break. Um, she really focused on her uh, school. She was going through college. Mm-hmm. And then she's kind of, for whatever reason, she pulled back. And she got her, you know, decided I want to come back for a little bit. And when yeah. she came back, it went from you can do whatever the fuck you want to very extremely detailed exactly what was okay and what was not. And she's like, I'm sorry. I know this is a lot. And I was like, right. I appreciate it. No, no, no. It. This is wonderful. Please tell me the things that you do and do not want to right. do. Yeah. And it was because you've already proven that you can. You don't mm-hmm. have to prove it. Now you come back and do what you enjoy. Right. And to me, that's like that's that's a big thing. And not that she didn't enjoy what she did, but she experimented and found out, I don't have to take the cattle prod to the pussy repeatedly. Right. I've proven that I can. And it's not as fun for me as... This other thing. This Whatever. other thing. Yeah. yeah. So... um. Fast forward to where we are now, like I not only, it's still huge to me, but not, now I've like, I've broken down the wall mm-hmm. because of social media. So people get to know the models better. They get to know right. me better. Um, so the wall's broken down. I make it, it's been clear for years that I've told people in those interviews that like, you know, this is, they're in charge, not mm-hmm. me. This is like a spa day. You go to the spa and you tell the people at the spa, here's a checklist of I want the hot rocks and the deep massage right. and the foot thing. You don't tell them how to do the massage or where to put the rocks, but right. you trust them to be, it's the Good same their thing. job, yeah. Right. So you come in and fill out what you're okay with, what you want, what you don't want, and then I facilitate mm-hmm. what you've asked to have happen to you mm-hmm. in my way. Um, and I've made it super clear. Like, I don't run this shit. I am lucky enough to have models who are willing to let me be the sadist that I am and use them so we kind of feed off of each other. But it's, it's yeah, it's... And I also, that when we go over the f- things I've started making public too, is that it's, here's the limit sheet. We've gone over the limits. I know exactly what I cannot do. And it sits on set so I can always right. reference it. Right. But I, on camera, I say, this is in stone. I don't get to change this ever. But, but you do. You can change it at any given moment. If you say, I love being slapped in the face. It's my favorite thing. And I come in and slap you one time and you don't, today is not your day, which yeah. is okay. Done. There's yeah. no yelling. There's no throwing a fit. Right. There's no, you said I could. I'm not going to make you, because or what you were saying earlier, oh, you're being a pussy, being just a p- let me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh, you, manipulative shit. You said shit. it was okay. Yeah, that's yeah. manipulation. That's fucking predator bullshit. If yeah. someone can't, it's in any situation. Yes. In if, Whether it's regular sex, whether right, it's this having this can a, be applicable to vanilla porn This also. can be applicable to the world. Yeah. If someone's, you go and ask someone, hey, would you like, uh, can I buy you a drink at the bar? Mm, mm-hmm. And if this person says no, there's no try, try again. Right. There's right. no let's keep pursuing them. Fuck them. I'm going to wear them down. That's fucking manipulation and it's predator shit. No means no. Right. Every fucking time, right. all the time. And I, I tell, you know, I was like, you say stop and we're done. Yeah. Now, if you suddenly say everything that's on the list is gone and I can no longer produce what I need to produce, right. then we have a bigger conversation. But it, yeah. it's still not me going, God damn it, you said I could. No, but also, also it's okay to have that bigger conversation and maybe end a day and say, you know what, I don't think I don't think this kind of content is a good fit for you right now. Right. Which is okay. It's completely okay. The unfortunate part is is that models think, oh, I made JP mad or yeah. I didn't get I wasn't as hard or, or as tough as he wanted me to be and he's never gonna hire me again or got there's still this stimulus uh, or not stimulus. There's uh this um um there's this idea that if you didn't do well on my site, mm-hmm. then I'm going to go tell everyone, and now you're blacklisted. And I remember having this conversation at Kink, and this girl showed up, and it was fucking machines, which every, yeah. we always joked that was like the uh, that it's was like the, the gateway, feeder site, right? Yeah. Which was weird because those machines are they wreak <laughs> havoc on the Hard. holes. Yeah. Um, so this girl shows up and she just, the whole time she's, oh, oh, and she keeps wincing and it's just, she's, I can see like, this is not cool for her. So I started, I stopped and I was like, are you good? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just maybe some more lube. And we try to accommodate everything. And you could tell she really, it was her first time in the army. She Mm -hmm. really wanted this to happen. Mm -hmm. And I finally was like, Hey, stop for a second. I was like, guys, can I have the room? And you know, everyone kind of stepped out of the room because I could tell she was fucking with her. Yeah. And I was like, look. I don't think this is the thing. And I was like, I don't get upset. I was like, because this doesn't mean that you don't get to work at kink. I was right. like, this isn't, and we aren't, and I won't say the name of this company that I use as a reference. I was like, this isn't this company where you have to show up and you have to do this and you mm-hmm. have to do this or they can't mm-hmm. hire you. Mm-hmm. The armor is like Disneyland for grownups. Yeah. I was like, if this isn't the ride for you, there's like 15 there's others. There's a whole bunch of other ones I of like, all different variations. Right. And I was like, so maybe instead of you taking this as a defeat, maybe you take this as a learning lesson that the machines suck for you and mm-hmm. this isn't cool. Let's go sit at a computer. Walk up to me with my office or to my office with me and let's look. And if there's something else, it turns out she came back and did one of the 
craziest hog ties. Like she came back and was a fucking phenomenal model doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. The machines just Those didn't machines, agree with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but it's so tough because people think if I fuck up this time, I'm, sh- I'm done. Like right. I'm never going to be able to do this again. Right. And it, sh- and it sucks that we, I think we're getting better in this industry, but I still think that it, there's still this, this bad, God damn it. I thought that was me that time. <laughs> Maybe they're syncing up now. Um, but there's this stigma that, you know, that, that if I don't do this or if I don't follow the director right. back over there in the private room and do the thing. And cause there's, 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 I talk about this on my podcast a lot. There's mm-hmm. this situation where people think that they have to do shit. They don't want to do just so they can excel in this industry. And it's not the case. Most of the people that I have seen, including yourself, didn't fuck yourself to the top. Yeah. You, well, you technically you did. Sure, sure. But you but didn't have like, to fuck everybody behind the camera yeah. to get to where you are. And yeah. that's the thing that I think a lot of people, they miss coming into this, is they think that they have to put up with certain actions on set from certain people because that's the only way they're going to make it, and it's not. Yeah, I think the best thing we can do is continue being very vocal about it. Right. And continue talking about it and continue saying you do not have to fuck to get a job. That is not your job. You know, you did it, you know, fucking, it, it's Nina Hartley says fucking is your job. It's not what you do to get the job. Right. And it's like, yes, that. yeah, it's, you know, you don't, you don't have to have sex with the director. You, you are allowed to have no's. You don't have to do anal if you don't want to, all of these things. And I feel like as long as we continue to be vocal about it, right? girls will come in as they do and we'll hear those things from, from us people who are theoretically respected. Right. And then be like, oh shit. Maybe, maybe I don't have to do this thing. Right. And the more that happens and the more people talking about it, it just snowballs. Right. Hopefully. Hopefully. And that's kind of the way I, I feel about it, too, is like telling people. And the, 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 the biggest thing is you have to be – you you are your biggest advocate. No mm-hmm. one's going to advocate for you as much as you will. And it's scary because you're like, fuck that. If you sit there and you're on a set and you think – I'm just going to get through this because it's almost over or they're almost finished or I don't want right. to piss. I don't give a fuck if it's 99% done and you're waiting on this last little thing, whether mm-hmm. it's a pop or whatever. Whatever. If the line gets crossed, fuck them. They've crossed a the line. Consent is now gone. And then when consent's gone, yeah. the rape the, word shows up. Right. Because anything sexual without consent is fucking rape. Right. Period. That's just what it is. Yeah. And if people had that in their head, performers, crew, and anyone else involved mm-hmm. – I think a, a lot less of this shit would happen, but there's this, just, I don't know. It's, right. it's, and I also follow up with this too. This, we talk about this openly because we, this is what we do for right, a living. This is our job. We, we have these conversations every right. time we go to work. It, but Susie at the bank, right. Jimmy at fucking HR over at Home Depot or whatever, all of these people, this happens in every workplace. Yeah. We just openly talk about it because we're trying to prevent it from happening because there's, unfortunately there's a small group of people and it's smaller. I feel like every mm-hmm. day it gets smaller and smaller. They still think, oh, well, she's here and naked and has got her pussy out, so I should be able to. Yeah. She must want me. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. Sorry, we went on no, the No, I know. We went on. We, but I, you started it. I'm blaming you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, let's, do, let's do one more. What do you want to talk about to wrap it up? Um... Do you want to talk about tell me a tell me a thing you, you we were talking about the things you want to be known for? Tell oh, yeah. me tell me a, uh, choose one pick one pick fuck <laughs> um or or like a category of things if picking one is too difficult. I think what I have what I've done with bondage like I when I first started and mm-hmm. I'll try and make this short when I first started the girl was tied up you walked in and you touch the breast you're like oh you're so pretty you're a dirty girl then you put your hand maybe in kind of rub and cup and like oh you really like this and it was kind of it was a lot to me creepier than it is now where to <laughs> na- now it's it's a lot more hardcore but it was really kind of like this like you'd expect this like <sighs> right the oh. heavy breathing you know it, yeah, it's it's it thinking back it almost seemed gross and it was a lot less <laughs> like if you would have told me in 2004 that you know one that I would still be around in seventeen years would sure. have blown my mind, but damn it! <laughs> Sorry, everybody, I'm really hungry. <laughs> I think the mic actually picked that one up. But yeah, it is. It's lunchtime. Yeah. Um. So, but that it did even more so that I would have been the person who was waterboarding people, right? And using words like cunt and 
four. And mm-hmm. I don't know if those are going to be okay for you too. But it might, yeah, that might. Ha- I don't actually know the rules. Yeah, there's. I I know that one gets flagged sometimes. But I these really degrading words. Yeah. Um, that I use in talking to pe- to to women like this and and like I said, waterboarding people mm-hmm. and and beating people until they're black and blue mm-hmm. and like making people cry and please, please, please stop. And obviously this is all consensual, but right. if you would have told me in 2004 that I would be doing this one day, I'd be like, bullshit, the fucking, inter- I'll go to jail for something like that. Right. Which is nice because it's allowed me to enjoy what I do. Not that I didn't before, but yeah. it's so to see it blossom. And it's not just me. It's not like a JP did all of this. We as a collective in the BDSM community did it right. uh, on the internet specifically because yeah. it became, like I said, we couldn't do sex, right. you know, for a while. Right. So you do the other things. So you did the other things, but so. To see, so to be remembered for someone who not only did the tie the girl up, slap her around, make her come, rinse and repeat for however many umpteen right. years, but doing things like the movies that I made. I want to be remembered for that, like taking something that was supposed to be so dark and hidden, even mm-hmm. in the corner of the porn store. We don't talk about the crazies right. that do this, to making movies that that reflected what we did and doing in them in a way that put them on a wider scale for people mm-hmm. to pay attention to because fuck 50 shades of gray period <laughs> that's bullshit all of it and that's fucking con- non-consensual r- rape is what that is um fuck it i said it yeah out there. now it's it's it, fuck 50 shades of gray yeah so but i and the, what made me start doing it is it was crap like that that didn't represent us or it was like you'd see this really awesome movie and they put duct tape on the mouth which i yeah. fucking hate um which is fine, I guess, if that's your thing. But sure. I started seeing shit that had crappy bondage in it, and I was like, why can't they get this right? So I decided I was going to start doing my own. And I am mm-hmm. not Tarantino. I'm not, you know, some of these big directors. But I want to be remembered for for coming out of the darkest corner of porn and mm-hmm. bringing it more into mainstream. And also because there, there is. Like, I have developed with the reputation. I have developed. I mean, I've worked with probably some of – the biggest names in the porn industry. Oh, I think you can claim that. Yeah. yeah. And to, to when I started, we were working off Craigslist right. to where now people like, are like, Oh, this that's JP. Fuck. Yeah. I want right. to go do I'm it. Angela White is going to come and shoot with you. Right. You know, or you, I mean, Casey Calvert, Angela White, all of these names. Yeah. Are, but, I, but you know, so Angela White, three time AVN performer of the year. Right. Wants yeah. Wants to come and shoot with you. Right. That's in, that's, that's such a huge pendulum swing from we were booking girls off of Craigslist who we saw once and wrote them a check and then we never saw them again. Right. And I don't remember their name. Right. And I and I think that's a big thing because it has it it's there was the virgin and that played a part. And being mm-hmm. the, 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 the major domo on the upper floor was a huge part because there's those are two really iconic things. But it's the progression of the bondage, the movies that we make now, right. the the way it's not like it's I mean, all of all of porn has progressed, you know, in a certain way. Mm-hmm. But the 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 span of being here and the consistency, I think, of constantly pushing the envelope and still being able to work with the biggest names in the industry and being right. trusted by the biggest, you know, all of the the agents, you know, like there's a lot of people that call mm-hmm. and say, "I want to work with Casey because I'm doing a bondage thing," and the agents are like, yeah. "Fuck you." Yeah. But if you, JP, okay, right. I'm on the way. Right. So. That I want to be remembered for. I just don't know who I'm going to pass all that down to. I've got a dungeon full of shit that I'm like, <laughs> what, what's going to happen when I retire? Someone's someone's going to in- acquire a lot of toys. Yeah. Hopefully it's not all rusted by the time <laughs> they get to it. But so, yeah, I think that's it. I think in a nutshell, yeah. it's being um, known as the meanest motherfucker on the internet, mm-hmm. but also known as one of, like, a very respected person in the adult industry and recognized as such because it's still... You know, I've seen people make one movie a year because they did it under Evil or they did it under this brand or mm-hmm. that brand, and they get nominated for Director of the Year, mm-hmm. and I produce hundreds of movies right. a year. I don't do the big features, but some of those are just gonzo shots that turn into a movie, and I get web director. Mm-hmm. So to pull out of that and not be the niche site or the right. niche director. Right. or to the get f- nominated in a in a bigger category. Right. To, to be recognized, not not necessarily nominated. This doesn't have to be an awards-specific right. thing, but to be to be recognized as a, a, par- a branch of the industry, a part of the industry. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm – and that's that's my ultimate goal is to be – and I'm getting there. Like yeah, the I movie feel like you did, are – yeah, moving in the right direction for sure. Yeah, when we did the movie – 
and it pulled up to mainstream and it snuck out of the BDSM and got right. put in. It scared the shit out of me because I was like, oh, I we're in the thriller category. I want BDSM. That's yeah. all I was going for. I didn't yeah, need we didn't mean to get into this thriller category. Yeah, I didn't oh know boy. You guys are put me up here with all yeah. the big names. Yeah. So getting to that point and having people see it and be like, this is the guy who taught me that BDSM is okay to be. And this is the guy who made these movies and is respected because of the, even though he did the meanest things, he mm-hmm. was the guy who was, you know, so it's, it's having that legacy of that rather than just the right one thing. Right. Cause there's so much more to it. Yeah. So I think that's a perfect way to end. Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. All right. Yes. Thank you so much for watching. I believe Holly will be back next week with regularly <laughs> scheduled pro- programming, but thank you so much, JP. Thanks for having This me. was really lovely. Thank you for, participating in this Thanks guest right. directing this guest fun. hosting experiment all right hopefully the story doesn't scare everybody <laughs> thank you so much bye this episode of holly randall unfiltered is brought to you by manscaped now we all love body hair on a man but you still got to keep that under control. So in addition to Manscaped's Lawnmower 3.0, which is their revolutionary electric trimmer for your nuts, they will not nick or snag them. They have recently also come out with their Weed Whacker. This is an electric trimmer for your ears and your nose, two other parts of your body that you definitely need to keep the hair under control. So go to manscaped.com, use code HOLLY, and get 20% off plus free shipping.